Hi, everybody. I'm Chef AJ, and welcome to Healthy Living. My guest today is Dr. Susan Roberts. The Energy Metabolism Laboratory, under the direction of Dr. Roberts, has a strong interest and expertise in behavioral interventions for weight management. More generally, Dr. Roberts' research has focused on understanding the roles of specific dietary composition and eating behavior factors on body weight regulation throughout the lifestyle with the long-term goal of using the knowledge from that research to develop effective weight control interventions that will be practical and scalable. Outcome assessments such as body composition and eating behavior, studies on the regulation of energy intake, and development of innovative intervention protocols, including behavior change in the domains of food intake and eating behavior, have been a focus in these studies. So please welcome Dr. Susan Roberts. This sounds, I love your, I mean, I don't know you yet. I'm excited to talk to you, but it just sounds fascinating because this is, this is my focus in life is weight loss and weight management. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and what you do. Chef AJ, thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. appreciate your interest in our research, and I certainly look forward to talking about all these things. My, my pleasure. Just You know how I heard about you, believe it or not, is I believe you're going to be speaking at a PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine Conference. And I looked your, your bio up, and I said, this woman is fascinating. I've got to talk to her. Oh, yeah. So I think, you know, my whole life has been devoted to weight regulation approximately. You know, I was actually... Um, I, my problem started in, when I was in elementary school in Britain, and I was actually the fattest kid in my school. You're and kidding. It, wow. I did not know that because I see your photo today, and you're lovely. I mean, you don't look like somebody that's ever been overweight. <laughs> well, thank you, but I was the fattest kid. And, wow. you know, somewhere in my attic I had, like, a hundred certificates for third place in every elementary race and, you know, high jump and things I ever did as a kid. Hmm. And, you know, it sounds like pretty good but I was in a really small rural school and there was only three kids wow (laughs) yeah so you know I I I suffered a lot from my weight and that's really why I went into the research that's why I love you know choosing good food and cooking it's it's a real pleasure to be doing the work I do Sure. You know, you you said something interesting. You used an interesting uh, verb. You said, I suffered a lot because of my weight. And, you know, I used to weigh almost 200 pounds, too. And while I believe that no one should be made fun of or ridiculed or mistreated, you know, there's this movement about, you know, love your body at every side, fat, fat acceptance. But I have never met an overweight or obese person that didn't suffer. Yeah, I think that's fine. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody should be shamed. I mean, goodness only knows the environment makes it so hard for people, you know, even if your genes are perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. I don't think shaming is the right way to go at all. Right. Um, But I think think people do suffer. And a lot of times it's it's in silence. And and even if they don't suffer physically, if they don't have a disease yet, like heart disease or diabetes, I I mean, especially women, it seems that, you know, I don't think anyone feels good in a body that's bigger than it it needs to be. No, absolutely. And, you know, it has all kinds of toxic effects. It means that, you know, they don't go to their physician as often as they should because, they don't want to know what the test results are and stuff like that. They don't want their doctor to say, you really should be losing weight. Um, so it impacts their health, their psychology, you know, how they interact with their kids and things. You know, it's, nobody should feel shame for that because it's not their fault. You're right, because you mentioned the environment, and I do believe that that is the number one problem because this problem, you know, did not occur 100 years ago. I mean, there were very, very few overweight or obese people, and really what has changed is the environment, and I really blame it on processed food. Yeah, it's a very complicated kind of interwilling, I think. You know, as I see it, I think that there was a lot of social changes. You know, there was more, there was refrigerators, there was freezers, there was more restaurants. You know, and just over time, portions went up, Mm -hmm. it became normal to overeat. It's become a really kind of a negative cycle that, you know, we've become accepting of, you know, portion sizes and ways to eat that are just simply outside what the human body can cope with. Exactly. And, you know, now at least, I mean, you have an accent, so I'm, I, you know, you said you're from Britain, but you're living in the United States now, at least in this country, more than two thirds of Americans are overweight and obese. And to be slender, you're, you're in the minority right now. 
Um, you, you are in the minority, and it does mean that you have to eat differently from a lot of people around you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's the same as true in Britain as well now. I mean, I, I've lived here since 1986, but when I go back now, I see precisely the same problems that we have here in America today. Who knew? You know, I just got back from speaking on a cruise ship. And while my faction of the people were healthy eaters, that most of the crews were from other parts of the country and they weren't. And you really could, without even looking at the size of the person, you could look at the plate and then know what size that person was going to be just by looking up. It was just fascinating. Oh, God, you know, cruise ships, I've often thought it would be a pretty good place to do some research studies on, you know, the impact of excess variety, in fact, mm-hmm. because, mm-hmm. yeah, they're like a toxic environment, you know, mm-hmm. you still one ship. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, one of the things I've noticed is whatever ultimate diet style a person decides to adopt, one of the things I've noticed is that, you know, the more vegetables a person eats, the slimmer they are. And that's just something I've noticed. And, you know, I, I believe they did some research at Tufts about that, that the more vegetables a person consumes, the lower their body weight and BMI. And you could, could certainly see that on the plates of the people on the cruise ship, the ones that were eating the salads and the fruit and the whole foods like the rice versus the ones that were loading their plates up with the pastries and the bacon and the cheese, you know. <laughs> You know, there's no question that loading your plate with veggies and doing that loading first so that the plate doesn't look, you know, lonely with a reasonable portion of the entree or the pasta or something like that, it's it's certainly one great strategy. I mean, I think the bigger problem that people have is that, you know, if you've gained 50 pounds, you know, you've had a difficult life or you've had a couple of kids and you didn't get rid of the pregnancy weight gain, how to get rid of those 50 pounds is more complicated than just eating more veggies. Right, right. Well, well, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is why why is weight loss so hard? And it seems it seems I don't know if I'm if I'm stereotyped, but it seems especially for women. I know women produce estrogen that makes it more difficult, but it does seem that weight loss is so hard, and so few people succeed at it. Yeah, I mean, I think it is hard. It's hard for everyone. You know, it's hard for women. You know, partly because of the hormonal changes we go through, and you certainly get hungrier before your period than at other times of the other times of the month. But, you know, the fundamental fact is that, you know, human bodies are not designed to lose weight. We had safety mechanisms in place that, you know, if you start eating fewer calories, your body says, hold on, you know, this is an emergency. You're not supposed mm-hmm. to be hungry. And, you know, it tells you to go eat. So, you know, finding ways to deal with that is not straightforward. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because while it's so hard to lose weight, it seems like it's pretty easy to gain weight. And what people don't realize is they it's not like you go to bed one night and wake up 50 pounds heavier. It it happens slowly over time. And just a small amount of increase in calories over what your body needs will cause that gain weight, weight gain, even like one extra Oreo cookie a day, I was told that could lead to like, you know, 15 pounds in a year. Oh, my God, yeah. For some people, it's one Oreo a day. You know, you eat one Oreo a day, and the statistics are, you know, you can gain 10 pounds a week or something, like 10 pounds a year or something mm-hmm. like that. But there's a whole other group of people who, who, when they go out to eat, it's hard for them not to, you know, just have an appetizer, a full main course, and a dessert. And they've eaten 6,000 calories, and that's two pounds of fat they've gained just by sitting at the table. Mm. So, you know, different people have different problems. Right. You know, I was a, a restaurant chef for many years, and what I noticed, Dr. Roberts, is that restaurants use more of the hyperpalatable, stimulating foods like more sugar, more fat, more salt than a person would ever use if they cooked at home. And one of my messages in Unprocess is we need to start making our food. Oh, yeah, you know, I would love to reform restaurants. I think that restaurants play a central role, you know, both in causing the problems that we have with with weight today, and they could play a really important part in, you know, helping us get slim and healthy again if they they chose to. Um, But right now they're not. No, that, that, you know, and, and especially the fast food restaurants, the ones where you don't even have to get out of your car to get your, get, get to get your 6,000 calorie meal. (laughs) Oh, when you don't even get out of the car, right. Actually, you know, my, my lab did a, did a study of, uh, of the calorie content of food from fast food restaurants and the places where they don't post calories. Right. And actually, it's a wash. There's no difference. You know, people blame fast food a great deal. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in fact, it's restaurants in general that cause the problem. 
Sure. Now, in your lab, do people actually come to the lab and live? Are you actually studying them in the lab? Or are you, you know, because I, I find any, I find research fascinating. It's just it's so and interesting. Sometimes they do. We, we do different kinds of studies. You know, we have 14 beds here where, you know, depending on the kind of study, if we want to kind of watch somebody around the clock, what they're eating, we can bring them in. But most of my research right now is in people who are, like, living at home, leading their normal life. Because that's where we mess up, you know. That's where the temptations after dinner, when you're watching TV or something, click in. So it's kind of understanding how to help people when they're in their normal environment that I'm really kind of focused on right now. Right, absolutely, because one of the things I teach is that your environment, especially your home environment, is going to be the number one predictor of your success because it's not what we do once in a while that matters, like having that rich meal at a restaurant on our birthday. It's what we do every single day. And if we have those kind of foods that we can't resist in our home, well, they're going to eat eat up. And I always say, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, absolutely. What you've got in your house eventually goes in goes in your mouth. And I think, you know, if you if you struggled with weight for a number of years, oftentimes, you know, sometimes you're buying the things that really tempt you. But other times it's family members that are causing you the problem. You know, you've got teenage kids. Sure. And you've got someone who's playing football and you can't have high-calorie foods in the house for him, so they mm-hmm. tempt you. You know, it's a complicated thing to fix, in fact. Absolutely, absolutely. So these people, I, I'm just so fascinated. I would love to come to your lab and be studied, but you're not doing that much anymore. But that would, that would just sounds like it would be so fun to live in your lab for two weeks, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, we would love to have you. Good heavens, that would be, that would be um, quite amazing. You could, you could write about, um, about the whole experience. I, you know, one thing that people often find when they come into the research center is that, um, it's very easy not to gain weight here. And, you know, they get fed regular food and stuff, but there's no kitchen. There's no fridge you can just go to with stuff in it that you know you like. And sure. just, you know, having all your meals provided for you in the right amount. They're not hungry. They're fine. And, you know, you take them out of the environment when they're used to kind of casually eating all the time. And it's a very kind of relaxing thing, in fact. It's, a, it's quite a revelation for many people. Wow. Do do you think that there is hope for all the people that are struggling with their weight or should they just give up and say, okay, I'm fat, that's it, not going to do anything about it? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, I I absolutely believe there's hope for everybody. You know, we did a a study that we published last fall in which we did brain scans on people going through our weight loss program. And, you know, we showed that we we could literally change their brains and that instead of their reward, their addiction centers, lighting up for junk food, we could get them to the place where they were lighting up for cyber cereal, grilled chicken, green salad. And, you know, that sounds ridiculous on the face of it, but we've got these MRI scans to prove it was actually happening. And people saying that, you know, they didn't crave French fries, they craved green salad. So I absolutely think that we can turn this around. It's not too late. How long does it take to facilitate such a change? Because I totally believe what you're saying. I'd, I'd be happy to send you a copy of my book. But I was, even though I'm vegan, I was a junk food vegan for until I was 43. And all I ate was, you know, candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream, never eating a fruit and vegetable. And now, and then I got, I, not only was I obese, I had the beginning of cancer. And now that's all I eat. And being on this cruise ship for 10 days, not having my vegetables, I couldn't wait to come home and eat, you know, some broccoli. So I do believe that your taste preferences can change. And I also believe that your preference are are dictated by what you habitually eat because I know people that were raised in a healthy manner really like these foods and people that were raised on McDonald's really like those foods. Um, So so, um, I totally totally believe you. And, you know, that's what we see in our research all the time is that if you can get people to eat healthy food and eat it consistently Mm -hmm. and put away the junk for a bit, that food preference has changed. I mean, our brains are quite plastic. I mean, every piece of our body, in fact, is kind of turning over all the time. And, you know, if you just give it some time and keep at it, those changes happen. You don't have to do anything more than, you know, eat the broccoli and suddenly it turns into food that, you know, know. your brain thinks is good. Well, how long long does it take for these changes to occur with the people you've worked with or the people in your laboratory or even for yourself when you make the changes? 
um, you know, the only answer is we don't really know the answer yet. The, the research that we did, we studied people at baseline before we put them through the program and at six months. And mm -hmm. so we could see these huge changes at six months, but I haven't yet done a study to say, you know, does it happen at four weeks? Does it happen at six weeks? My gut reaction is that it happens in different people at different times. I see. You know, I that see. Everyone, everyone has their own signature for how long it takes. Sure, sure. And, and you know, it just seems to me, though, as hard as it is to lose weight, the recidivism rate is so high. It, you know, according to, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of James Hill and the National Weight Control Registry, but I believe something like 98% of people that lose weight actually gain it back within two years. And that, the, the, you know, if that was a, pro, if that was a for-profit business, they'd be out of business. Yeah, it's something like that. So I think, um, you know, I think the, the, the whole problem is that, you know, the big commercial weight loss programs and most of the books, they're not teaching people how to really live on the kinds of healthy food that they need to maintain weight loss. They're telling people to use their willpower, grit their teeth and, you know, and kind of count calories and stuff until they've lost the weight. But they haven't really learned how to eat in a way that they enjoy and that's good for their weight. So it doesn't surprise me at all that most people are today are gaining the weight back. But I think based on the new MRI research and what we see in the, you know, the company that I gave our program to, uh, I don't think that's necessary. Most, most people going through the program today are keeping that weight off. That's fantastic. Because like you, the, these programs that you mentioned, a lot of them have you buy their food, which is just another form of unhealthy, highly packaged, highly processed food, you know, these bars and shakes, and they're never learning to eat real food or cook real food. Right, right. And, you know, the food isn't very good either. So you right. get bored, and yeah. then you go back to wishing that you had something good to eat. Right. Well, you know, why do you think it is that so many people just love unhealthy food? You know, <laughs> they just love it. I think it's just the brain, you know, the way the brain's made up. I think if you, anything that you eat repeatedly, you know, your brain comes to think it's good for you, whether it's good for you or not, because we, you know, we love habits, we're creatures of habit. And so, you know, if you don't take a snack to work and there's a vending machine there and you reproducibly get hungry at 4 p.m. and you go down to the vending machine and eat M&Ms or something, mm. your brain learns that 4 o'clock means M&M time, and so it you know, kind of creates a sensation of cravings, trying wow. to make you do the same thing that you did yesterday. It's just a question of habit. Wow, so it's sort of like, a, like Pavlov's dog or people that drink alcohol every single night. It's just, they, they've just created habits. That's really T totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's, it's, you know, so reversing those habits is a job. There's no question about that. But it's not a hard job because all you have to do is repeat the healthy stuff and keep repeating it. And you kind of paste over a better habit on top of the old one. Exactly. You know, I find the same thing with exercise. Like, I, you know, I didn't exercise till I was 51 and a half. And, and now that I do it, I mean, I don't even think about it anymore because I, I it's a habit, like you say. And it takes, you know, I, I read somewhere that it takes at least 15 days or three weeks to build a habit, but however long it takes the individual, you have to do it consistently. And that's, that's the key thing is it has to be consistent. I, you know, in my experience with the weight loss groups, 15 days usually has some people popping up saying, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm craving apples or you know, <laughs> something like that, that you would normally crave. Other people take longer, but you know, 15 days is a good place to start. Right. So, what what do you think about there's many documentaries that have come out lately like uh about childhood obesity there's one that came out last year about sugar fed up so what what do you think about these documentaries specifically fed up there's a lot of doctors and a lot of researchers that have been talking for years about sugar being one of the primary problems being so addictive and you mentioned a lot about your brain scans and MRIs and they have shown at least uh, Dr. Pam Peek who I heard speak at the Dr. McDougall program that that sugar is as addictive to our brains as heroin and cocaine. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, my honest opinion is that this stuff, that, that the, the kind of extreme paranoia about sugar is a flash in a pan and that we're going to go back to a view which says anything with this, which is packed with calories is, mm -hmm. is like bad news for weight loss. So that means very high-fat foods, you know, foods with a lot of white flour, foods with sugar, 
Yeah, sugar's, sugar's not great health food, but I don't think it's, like, hugely worse than, you know, some other things. Sure. I, but, I, you know, one of the things I, I, I read that, that children today get 25% of their calories from soda. And to me, like, any liquid calories don't seem to be conducive, at least in my experience, to weight loss, whether they're from alcohol or, you know, or soda, that we need to eat food we, we need to eat. We need to chew. We need to eat food with fiber. And that's what, we, what makes us satiated, not drinking our food. That's definitely true. Anything that's true, you know, in our weight loss program, we actually pretty much ban liquid calories. I'm not yeah. saying any nutrient is off the is off the menu, but soda, juice, you know, I'd I'd much rather my dieters have their food and something they can chew, and I, and I find that very helpful. I agree. So you you how how old were you when you first became overweight? That if you, if you remember. Oh, well, I, I went up and down for years. I mean, when I was kind of aware of it in school, I must have been about nine or ten or something like that. And then I used to kind of starve myself into submission for a number of years. And then when I was first married, I lost it again, and I gained 50 pounds. Um, so the last time I was actually clinically obese was when I was uh, was about 20 years ago. So I, I lo- at that point, I thought, I was a nutrition researcher studying metabolism, actually, not food, and I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm a beast. Half of America is a beast. And I changed my research to focus on how to try and, you know, bring the obesity epidemic down and help individuals with their own personal weight. So that's mm-hmm. about 20 years now I've kept the weight off. That's fantastic. And, and so you actually practice what you preach, which is very, which is very, very refreshing. Oh, totally, totally. And I think it brings, you know, it's very helpful to me because, you know, I identify with every one of my dieters. I think about food a lot. I enjoy the taste of food a lot. I like, you know, making food. I like feeding people. Um, you know, so I absolutely think that you can do all of those things and stay slim and healthy if it's the right kind of food. Absolutely. What, what's what's surprising me, Dr. Roberts, not really surprising me, but disturbing me, I guess would be a better phrase, is that both of us were, were overweight or obese when we were young. But when I was the fattest kid in school, which I was, I, it, I was the only one. The other 39 weren't. But now I'm told that one out of every three children under the age of 18 is already obese. And it just seems like this epidemic is starting younger. I know. I think that's a huge, huge problem. I mean, you know, right now what I'm focused on with iDiet is is getting a program that works for adults to help, you know, parents and grandparents and everybody else in between to lose their weight. And, you know, kind of all my bandwidth is taken up with the adult piece. But I did actually train in, you know, kid nutrition when I was in graduate school. And so it's my hope that as soon as we've kind of got that slowly on the road, I'm going to take a step back and do a conversion for kids so that we can, you know, capture, you know, them from babies up to try and, you know, try and give some help to that generation, which is certainly going to have a lot more problems even than, you know, you see in our age group. And and what I've found, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't know everyone, but it, it seems to me that at least every overweight or obese child I've met has at least one parent that's overweight or obese, and that it seems to be much rarer that when the two slender parents would have a, a child, because it seems that, the, you know, until the kid's 16, he's not driving himself, you know, to 7-Eleven to get his Slurpees, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, you know, that that's... So it used to be true universally. I mean, you know, the nightmare is that sometimes in the clinics now you see, you know, obese kids coming in with two thin parents and they don't have an easy, yeah, they don't have an easier time fixing them either because there's just so much blame that the parents are heaping on the kids. Wow. And I'm thinking, you know, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. But the parents don't know how to fix it because, you know, they're being restrained themselves. And the problems are happening outside the house. Yeah. This, this, is, this is definitely a problem. And one of the things that I, I learned from the documentary Fed Up and then I see in my life is that while exercise is, is important, movement is important, you can't out-exercise a bad diet. Oh, you know, ha- hallelujah. I, I was writing that, you know, there, I was writing that five or ten years ago that if we wanted to solve the world's obesity problem, the obesity problem in America, you had to just, you know, you had to be smart about how you do that, which is not telling people to go and work out in the gym. 
not for weight loss because it doesn't work very well for weight loss. It right. makes it you was, hungry and right. then you eat more. Right. It, and now that, that's you know, mm-hmm. more widely accepted, thank God. Yeah. Well, I mean, I and I'm not telling people not to exercise because, I mean, I did not lose my weight exercising. I was nursing a post-fractured knee that took a long, long time to heal. And I want people to know that you can absolutely lose weight without exercise. But my understanding is if you want to maintain it, you're going to have to add something to the mix. And there's so many other wonderful reasons to exercise, improve self-esteem, bone health, joint health. I mean, there's there's millions of reasons to exercise. But like like you said, weight loss is not really one of them. Exactly. I mean, exercise is extremely important to health. It's extremely important for preventing weight regain. It's just mm-hmm. not very good for actual weight loss. That's it. You just by hit the nail on the way, I should, mm-hmm. I, I should say that, you know, it's almost like you're my twin. It's weird. You've got a knee fracture so bad. Well, is, it your, a, knee, yeah, is it your left yeah. knee or your right knee? Um, uh, it's right. Oh, mine's my left. So we're, so we're, <laughs> but you, what you just said is so important. <laughs> That exercise is important for weight regain. That is that is so true, I find, that, that if you don't want to regain it, you do need to exercise. And the reason I say that is my partner, John Pierre, who is the fitness guy, he doesn't like me saying that, but, but sometimes when you get people that, are, especially if they're extremely obese, you can't just, like, throw them in a gym, you know? They'll, sometimes all they can do is, you know, maybe do some gentle walking in a pool, but as they start losing weight and start feeling better, they can they can do more, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's why in IDA we start with the food and then we move on to exercise later. Because, you know, when somebody's lost 30 or 40 pounds, they feel so much better that they're ready to start adding exercise anyway. You don't have to push them. So it's a very natural progression. A- a- absolutely. I completely agree. And what? please tell our listeners what IDA it is. I looked it up a little bit, but I'd much rather have you articulate it because I'm sure you could do a better job. Oh, sure. So I, got, so I got to the point, I'm a researcher, you know, we have this totally amazing weight loss program, it works two or three times as well as, you know, any other commercial program out there. And I thought, I'm a researcher, I don't have the, you know, the ability to scale this into a national thing to help millions of people. So I just gave the program to a startup company and then doing it. Uh, you know, if you go to www.myidiet.com, mm-hmm. they have all these video conference programs and other kinds of stuff, you know, to help to hold people's hands through the process of, you know, working out how to lose weight and, you know, and keep it off indefinitely. And, wow. and it's working, it's working amazingly well. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Now, now, for someone like me that, or some of my listeners that follow a plant-based diet, would if they did I diet, would that be an option? Um, totally. We have a whole line of um, vegetarian menus. It's very easy. We have a vegan conversion plan. Um, That's so it's very it's very easy to you know to do that. You know, I'm not personally um, only eating plants. I eat a great deal of plants, but we have a lot of people who go through the program who are to plant-based eaters, and, and it works really well for that. That's fantastic, because I just think a program is, is very helpful. I, you know, no man is an island, and while there are individuals out there that can do it alone, the research shows that just being part of a group or a community, it really, I think, helps motivate you, and it, I think whatever program people choose, I think just having a coach or having a group to support you is, is very important. Exactly, exactly. We have a coach, we have, you know, we create groups, so they get some friends, and then they have a coach who leads the whole thing. There's a, there's a lot of kind of activity on the web that keeps people, people, people engaged. And we teach people something every week, because, you know, there's so much disinformation out there about nutrition right now. That's part of the problem. People don't know what to believe. Yeah. So every week we do like a mini education unit you know, so that people become experts about their own, you know, weight control. Right. And a lot of the a lot of the nutritional information they get in sound bites from popular T V shows when they're really that's not really necessarily accurate <laughs> to say say it in a nice way. <laughs> oh God, absolutely there's so much there's so much bad stuff out there that, you know, I, you know, if you don't have a degree in nutrition, I don't know what you would think these days. Absolutely. So what do you think of things like food addiction and emotional eating? What are your, because I, I, I interview a lot of people on healthy living and I don't necessarily just interview people that think like me or people I even agree with because I like hearing other people's opinions. And that seems to be a very controversial subject because I've interviewed some experts in that area. And then I've heard other people say, oh, it's not real. It doesn't exist. 
Oh, I think food addiction is a real thing. You know, high calorie foods do kind of create a nutrient rush, and you know, some susceptible people are very, you know, find themselves, you know, thoroughly addicted in the, you know, in the sense of cocaine or heroin. You can go through and you can check the boxes, and their symptoms are, are very similar. Uh, it's not everybody. And I think, you know, the term is used quite casually now. So a lot of people, you know, say, oh, I'm addicted, when in fact, you know, once we put them through the program, they find out that that stuff drops off the map once you get rid of hunger. And once you get them eating regular healthy food, they find that they, in fact, they were misdiagnosing themselves. So I think it's true, but not for as many people as who, who think it's true. Yeah, and what what about emotional eating? Do you put that under the same auspices as food addiction, or would you consider that separate? You know, there's a lot of emotional eaters out there. What I tell our people is, you know, we can certainly reduce that, but I don't think you have to eliminate that in order to be a healthy weight. I mean, I myself am an emotional eater, and sometimes when I get stressed, I find my, you know, I've opened the fridge door before I've even, you know, kind of been aware I was going to do that. As long as you get your general food habits under control, if you're an emotional eater, you can still stay a healthy weight. Sure. And I think also it depends what you're emotional, emotionally eating on because, you know, it's different to have a couple extra apples or bananas than it is to have, you know, a you know five-pound bag of M&M with peanuts. You know, m- much different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we train people how to make that transition so that, you know, instead of, you know, reaching for the chips, yeah, that, that's a candy bar, something like that. They've got something good that they actually want to eat at that time. Right. That that sounds great. I I really want to check out your program. It's just it sounds wonderful. So a lot of people tell me uh, that I work with that you know they've had like you know trauma or, or especially early childhood trauma and and that's why it's so difficult for them to lose weight. And I'm not discounting the horrible things that happen to people. I've had I had a very traumatic childhood myself. But how can we give people hope that that they're that it's what happened to them in the past doesn't define their ability to lose weight. I'm not saying it maybe doesn't make it more difficult, but I guess my question is how do things like stress and trauma play into a person's ability to lose weight? Um, I think that, you know, food is a kind of an all purpose comfort device. You know, you have some food and it, you know, produces a surge of dopamine. You do feel better for having some food Mm -hmm. and, so, you know, I think it's perfectly, you know, normal and understandable that people have built up these habits of dealing with, you know, childhood or other kinds of traumas and stress by eating. In the moment of eating, that eating makes you feel better. And, you know, a lot of nutritionists and psychiatrists say, oh, you know, you can't fix, you know, a bad marriage by eating. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in the moment of eating, you do, you do feel better. So what we simply do is, you know, we, we, we help people recognize the triggers and stuff like that, but we focus on channeling them into healthy food. And once you do that, you know, you don't have to get rid of the trauma in order to be healthy. Right. I mean, and, and, and they can if they want. I'm not, I'm not suggesting they don't deal with it with a, with, a, with a professional, but I just hear, well, I can't because, you know, it's always, it always seems to be there's some excuse why somebody can't. And then they put it off, they put it off, and they get heavier and heavier. And it seems to me that the, the, the risk outweighs the benefit so that this momentary pleasure of dopamine surge from eating, I don't know anybody that long-term feels better. You know, it's just, it seems such a, like such a momentary thing for, for you know a moment of pleasure for a life of pain it, it just doesn't I guess I'm just trying to understand these people's psychology so I can better help them yeah totally you don't, you don't feel better in the long run in fact you feel worse if you kind of overeat because you were stressed about something and the next morning you know you wake up and you feel fat and stuff I mean it makes you feel worse in the long run but I think what we'd say is that, it, you know, it can take years to kind of, you know, if you're working with a psychologist or a psychiatrist to deal with, you know, really major issues in your, in your life that have been hard. Um, in the meantime, you know, we can teach people in ways to eat that they can get all the same comfort from stuff that doesn't make them gain weight. And, you know, that can have very indirect benefits on, you know, helping their, their life challenges too. Absolutely. And and the thing is, is while 
while losing weight is not going to necessarily solve these other issues, they'll feel better and they might be more apt to really deal with these issues. You know what I mean? And because a lot of times they say, I'll, I'll lose weight when, you know, but the road to someday leads to never. And if you wait till you fix all your stress and emotional problems to, to change your diet, <laughs> you're never going to do it. In my opinion, I've never seen that happen. Yeah, we, we had one woman who went through the program a while ago who was in a very bad marriage. And, you know, there was a ton of things wrong with this marriage. But, you know, one of them was that he used to try and overfeed her. You know, he would mm-hmm. walk in after she after she walked in the door from a bad day, he would walk in the door with, you know, like five pounds of her favorite candy. Mm-hmm. And um, she lost 100 pounds and then she divorced the guy. Um, well, so, then she lost an extra yeah. 200 pounds by getting rid of the guy. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. Um, um, right. So, so exactly. So she was, uh, so, and and I saw her recently. You know, she looked slim and beautiful, and she had a new boyfriend, and life was very good. In fact, you know, that's interesting what you said about this particular case because I find it's not always husbands and wives, but that, that a lot of times people do sabotage efforts of friends and family members, especially those that are still overweight themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, totally. I mean, I've experienced it myself. I mean, I was at some dinner, a dinner with some friends a while ago, and, you know, it was one of these, like, four-course dinners, and there was a lot of people, and it got to a dessert, and there was this very rich, heavy dessert, and it was plated, so I didn't have an option to say no, thank you, and so I took, like, a half a bite, mm-hmm. and I just left my plate, and the host looked at me and said, oh, my God, you can't even eat dessert now. Yeah. And it was in front of all these other people, and it was, you know, it could have been very shameful. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, talked to a lot of people obviously about this and the nature of my work, but definitely, friends and family can be your worst enemy. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I find that too. I was just, um, I was just at a, 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 a Shabbat, a Friday night Shabbat service, and they they serve a, a bread called challah. It's a Jewish challah, but they made it vegan. And and I don't eat bread mainly because I'm gluten intolerant anyway. But the point was, is these people were like just pushing this bread on me. They knew who I am and what I stand for. And it's like, you know, what part of no do you understand? I mean, no and no thank you should be a complete sentence. But it's just, it's really interesting how the way somebody eats, especially if they've gotten thin and healthy really seems to trigger other people because when I was when I was fat and I used to smoke cigarettes and eat like crap nobody would say anything to me but now that I'm slim and have maintained it for several years everybody's it seems like you know an, is a nutritionist around me and it seems to bother people like if you're always thin nobody seems to care but if you've lost weight it's it's I don't know it just seems to bother people <laughs> right it's you know it's, it's these things you can learn to you can learn to cope with these things you know after a while i mean i actually think that claiming a medical diagnosis is sometimes the easiest way to mm-hmm. shut people up you know if you say i'm I allergic got, i'm allergic to blood pressure sure on. I, I tell my students think, that you're allergic yeah. you know especially at restaurants yeah. yeah well i'm sorry go ahead um, yeah, if you, if you say you're allergic or if you say you've got high blood pressure and your doctor's told you you have to lose 10 pounds, sure. you know, that's sometimes an easier thing for friends and family to, you know, to let you get away with than, than just saying, no thanks, I don't like baklava or whatever. Right. So the, the the diseases you see that coexist with obesity, lots of, you know, probably things like heart disease and diabetes, I, I, how much of that do you see go away when somebody gets to a normal weight? Oh, God. So with the level of weight loss that we're achieving in the program today, the commercial program at myidiet.com, we estimate that we can actually reverse about 50% of actual diabetes diagnosis. If someone, if someone comes in and they've been recently diagnosed, in half of those cases we can get them completely off meds, um, Sleep apnea is almost 100% treatable. We pre-diabetes is almost 100% treatable, and then quite a substantial proportion—I can't—I can't say what—can get off hypertension and hypercholesterol meds. It's all about the number of pounds you lose. If you can lose a lot of pounds, you can reverse those things pretty reliably. That—that's—that's that's very. Uh encouraging i think and it's a great reason for people to want to want to try this do you, do you find that slow is 
slow weight loss, slow sustained weight loss is best than, than doing these more crash diet type programs? Um, well, okay, so that's a difficult question. I, I think that, you know, the human body can only lose two or at most three pounds in a guy of fat a week. You know, you just can't you just can't lose any more weight. So, you know, within those standards, I think the faster you lose weight, the better. That's to say two or three pounds of fat. If somebody's kind of creeping along at half a pound every two weeks, they can get disillusioned and give up. But sometimes there's a very unrealistic idea of what fast means out in the outside world. Mm. How, what do you think is the best indicator of what a person should weigh? Because I know with a lot of my clients, my female clients, they're obsessed with the scale. And, you know, sometimes I find that people lose pounds mm. or inches. And I, we, I don't really recommend people weighing themselves obsessively or every day. And, and, and how do we even know what we should weigh? Because my understanding is these, these, these height weight charts have just gotten more and more liberal over the years. So how, how does a person know what they really should weigh? Yeah, it's a pretty difficult question, isn't it? Because, you know, BMI is actually not a very good indicator of body fatness. I mean, I think, honestly speaking, people themselves have usually got the best impression of what they should weigh. You know, they come into the program saying, I want to lose 20 pounds. And they get to 20 and they say, you know, this is not really what I want to lose. I want to lose another 10. Or they might come in saying they wanted to lose 50 and they get to 30 and they feel thin enough. I think everybody has a, you know, a kind of a body size that's right for them, and they know it. And yeah. and you know, if you listen to your body, you can get very good advice. Yeah, I agree with that for most things. What do you think of like actual like diagnosable eating disorders, like binge eating disorder, bulimia, and anorexia? Do you think that these these are psychological conditions in the DSM? But do you think that a lot of times it's because of people trying to lose weight often I, I find that these most of the people I know with these conditions it starts at a pretty young age you know they don't like just become 60 and then become I mean I'm not saying it can't happen how do you think that plays into um, uh, people's you know desire to lose weight or inability to lose weight in the long run when they have one of these conditions oh I think you know because the whole of society is obsessed with losing weight it's very harmful for the young generation I mean you see kids of 10 and 11 dieting in school and saying that they're fat and that, you know, they've picked it up at home. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly this kind of obsessive culture with, with, you know, with weight loss does contribute to those things. But as I said, you know, it's not the weight loss per se. It's the fact that there's lots of, you know, kind of ineffective, you know, bad ways to lose weight out there that make people hungry, that increase temptation. And so they're kind of pushing people towards an eating disorder rather than, you know, helping them get the weight off in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Do you think this obsessive culture in regards to weight loss is, is typically an American thing, or do you see it in other countries as well? Um, I, I think it's in everywhere at this point. It's not, it's not so bad everywhere. As part of my research at Tufts University, we have an international obesity consortium. So wow. we're working. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of fun. We that sounds fascinating. That, that, I, I would love to hear more about that because just having got off a cruise ship, what I noticed, and, and again, please you know, don't write me saying I'm being disrespectful. This is just an observation, is that the people that I've worked with, the people I know in the United States, you can never be too thin. But a lot of these people from these other countries were quite heavy and wearing things like thong bikinis. Like even in L.A., if you're one pound overweight, you would never see that. They seem to have, even though they were more overweight, seemed to have a much better body image and self-acceptance from some of these other countries. So I'd love to hear more about what you just said. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's very country specific. I mean, I think a lot of affluent countries, you know, feel close to America. But, you know, if you do, if you go to Africa, I mean, I do also do malnutrition research in West Africa right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to be 300 pounds is actually better than being 200 pounds, for example. You see these, um, these wives of you know, rich politicians and stuff, they glorify in being very heavy. Mm. Because that's a sign of affluence, right? Exactly, exactly. Because when, you know, in places where food is short, um, to show conspicuously through your own person that that doesn't apply to you is a, is a, is a source of pride. 
That is so you know, interesting. That's, that's going to change, but right now, certainly the countries that have kind of become affluent quite recently have not yet, you know, come to fair body fat in the way that rich countries do. Wow, that that is absolutely fascinating. I mean, when you look at like even paintings, like remember the artist Rubens that would like the 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 models were much heavier and it would actually show you know show fat rolls in the painting and that that was that was considered beauty back then. Right, right, exactly. So yeah, when, and, you know, it's very unhealthy to have models with a BMI of sixteen and stuff like that presented as healthy images today. Well, a lot, of, a lot of them have eating disorders, too. And, you know, there are people that are naturally slim, but I get clients that are actresses and models that you look at them and they're like, they're perfectly healthy. They look, you know, thin, but yet they they ha- they say they have to lose 10 pounds just to get these jobs. And I'm like, I'm thinking like, I mean, should I even be helping them? Because, you know, you, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it just creates, it perpetuates this, this really unreachable stereotype for other people because the, especially the young women, they compare themselves to these models that are usually airbrushed not usually probably always and it's 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 even unattainable for them sometimes to maintain these weights that are lower and yet it it just seems so hard because the culture the environment is full of the kind of food that is not going to support your leanness and then it's like we're getting mixed messages we're told it's bad to be fat and yet we look at the people on television and movies and there's very few overweight or obese people in film, television, and magazines. And usually it is they're the comic relief or something. You know, they're not really the lead. Yeah, we don't. We actually don't take um, people like that in our I diet program. And, you know, if anybody comes in who's 20 and, you know, already has a BMI of 20 or something like that, we, we turn them away because, mm-hmm. you know, it's not helpful for other people to have them trying to lose weight when, you know, you have a real reason to lose 50 and get off meds and stuff. So we, we, we don't take those people. Absolutely. And I want to encourage people that no matter how much weight they have to lose, any, any amount of weight is helpful. And I, I say this as, as, you know, I was going to ask you about your pivotal moment when you decided to finally lose weight once and for all. And for me, well, first of all, I was a health educator and a chef, and people were actually calling me fat on Facebook and YouTube and saying, if the plant-based diet's so great, why are you so fat? But it really was breaking my knee that was the pivotal a moment for me. I was almost 50 years old, and when I broke my knee, it was a very bad break. And because I was so overweight and have never had exercise, I couldn't use the crutches or the walker. So I was in a wheelchair for four months. Well, sedentary, which even worse, I gained even more weight. And I vowed that when I got out of the chair, I was really going to do something about it because I, I was told I needed surgery and I'm deathly afraid of anesthesia. And and the doctor had said, well, you know, every pound you're overweight is four to five additional pounds of pressure to your knee. And he said, well, do you ever think about losing weight? And I'm like, I wanted to punch him and say, no, no, that never crossed my mind. But, but that was really the pivotal moment for me. And I want people to know that, you know, don't look at it like if you have 100 pounds to lose because any amount of weight you lose, you're going to feel better right? Oh, um, yeah, I, so f- for me, my pivotal moment was um, I, I gained 55 pounds when I had my, when I was pregnant with my daughter. And I kept saying to myself, don't worry, it'll come off, it'll come off. But, you know, she was born and she wasn't that big. And I was still like 50 pounds heavy after that. And I thought, this is like totally unacceptable. Nine mm-hmm. months, I gained 50 pounds of fat. That's, um, yeah. But that's crazy because your baby didn't weigh 50 pounds. So how I'm thinking, like, how is that even possible? Well, I, you know, I think at some point I stopped weighing myself. Yeah. And so, you know, I was count, I, at 55, I think I stopped getting on the scale. And so I was probably something like 60 by the time I actually delivered. Wow. Wow. 55 pounds, not yeah. 55 years old. Okay. <laughs> Okay. No, yeah, yeah, no, it was very shocking. And, you know, it changes your appearance. You know, today I, I keep all of my, you know, kind of free weights and stuff that I exercise with in my basement. Mm-hmm. If I can, if I have to carry 40 pounds up the stairs, it's like a totally shocking experience. And I get up the stairs and I'm extremely worn out. But right. if you're carrying 40 pounds around on your person, that's what you have to suffer every day. It's terrible. I know, and it's almost like people get used to it. You know, I shop at Costco every week, and I buy a 10-pound bag of organic sweet potatoes. This is only 10 pounds, and just lifting it into the cart, I'm thinking, this is so heavy, and I had six of these, you know, on my body at one point, and I'm like, wow, you know, it's it's just amazing. Were were you the only overweight person in your particular family, So, uh, or were there other people? No, no, no. 
Oh no, my my whole family my whole family were were overweight. We loved food. My parents were said, you know, we're not a family that exercises. We're a family that likes to eat. No, no, everyone was everyone was overweight. So this was like, it was our family was very unusual when we we were growing up. So right. I was. Yeah. Because I wonder how much genetics plays a role. I interviewed a, a Houston cardiologist, Dr. Baxter Montgomery, recently, and he said that it's not so much the obesity that's that's uh, that's genetic or hereditary, but it's the recipes that are passed down. And I've read some research where they take like identi- like like people that were born to obese parents, but they were raised somewhere else, and they still seem to often become obese, even if the even if the adoptive parents are slim. So how much does genetics play a role? Because I've always read that genetics really only loads the gun. It's really your diet and lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So we've, I've actually done some research on that in my lab. We had um, identical twins read apart and read together. We did some studies a few years ago. And so what we showed was, you know, in terms of heritability, something like 50% of your body fat is inherited and 50% is what you do to yourself. And what what that means in terms of pounds is that, you know, you can live anywhere in a range of about, you know, you can be 60 pounds, 70 pounds heavier or lighter um, than where you are today according to what you do to yourself. You know, if you're like a constitutionally lean person who in one environment would lay 100 pounds, you can be 170 in another, or you can weigh 150 in one environment and 220 in another. So it's not everything, but, you know, in terms of dealing with the amount of body fat that most people in America would like to get rid of today, you can do all of that with environmental, you know, that's to say dieting changes. That That is so interesting. You're British. I don't know if you've seen this, but I saw a BBC documentary that was fascinating, and it was called Why Thin People Can't Get Fat. And what they did is they took naturally lean people in a laboratory where they force fed them something like 10,000 calories a day. And these people could barely do it. They had to like melt ice cream down to get them in. And they didn't gain weight. They measured them in those machines that they use for astronauts when they get back. And apparently they said that these very naturally lean people, no matter what they do, when they increase their calories, their metabolism increases to meet the needs. So I don't know if you're familiar with that documentary, but what is it about, I mean, do we... When when you're learning things or when you're st- doing this research in the lab, do you ever study the behaviors or the metabolisms of these naturally lean people to learn how it could help those that aren't? Yeah, yeah, we do study metabolism. Um, we I used to study metabolism almost, almost exclusively till I switched over to food. And you know, we've we've certainly seen metabolic increases when we've overfed people. We did some overfeeding and underfeeding studies. Um, and I think metabolism is part of it. You know, everybody gets fat at some point. If they eat 10,000 calories, some people will gain two pounds and some people will gain three pounds, but everybody will get fat. I mean, I think the, the big the difference with lean people is that they're able to go out and have a huge meal and then they don't think about food for 24 hours or something like that. And so they recover without even thinking about it. You know, so you as a kind of a weight challenge person could see this thin person stuffing their face. Yeah. And it looks like they're eating any amount of calories. But they're not they're actually kind of recovering at other times in ways that, you know, those of us who are weight challenged our bodies don't naturally do that. Right. Well, do do we know, like for instance, when we're born, is there a way to know if we're going to be one of these weight challenged people? Or is it just something we have to figure out, well, if we get fat, then that was us. Um, I think we have to figure it out. You know, there's, it's, there's a lot of important self-awareness that goes into this. But, you know, my opinion is that, you know, with the exception of maybe, you know, 1% of the population who really have such severe genetic obesity that they're going to be obese whatever, for most of us, we can live our life as a thin person or a heavy person, you know, according to how we lead our lives. We We definitely have that choice. So, so, so it's not. So we're not dictated by our brain. It's not our brain that's making us do this. It's, it's really behavioral, for, like you say, except for this rare one percent of people that I, that I didn't even know about until now. That that will be. Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can, we can make those changes. You know, we are dictated by our brain, but we can change our brain. 
Sure. So now I have to ask, because this is new to me, these 1% of all people that will be obese no matter what, is, is that a, a rare disease or is there any way to help these people? Because that's, that's fascinating that there even exists such a, a population. <laughs> uh, I hope it's not classified as a disease. I mean, you know, the, you know, the healthcare profession will like that a lot because, you know, they'll, you know, they'll find another label to put us on stuff like that. Sure. But I think that... Um, you know, it's not going to help anybody's psychology, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, which is going to be a problem. You know, the the medical profession are not going to help people lose weight because they don't know how. Absolutely. So they're going to label the disease, give them drugs that will probably be found to be unsafe after a few more years of testing and get taken off the market. Yeah. And, you know, we'll just be left with a lot of people who feel worse about themselves. Well, you know, I'm going to be interviewing a gastric bypass surgeon in, uh, in a few weeks. How do you feel about that operation? Because I, I find that I have a very hard time helping people after they've had that operation be successful. Oh, my goodness. You know, so, so let me say this. I hate gastric bypass surgeons. Um, <laughs> it's my personal mission in life to save everybody from gastric bypass surgery. They had so many complications afterwards, so yes. many nutritional deficiencies. You know, I can cry sometimes because I go across the street to the hospital here to help people who've had gastric bypass surgery go in a behavioral weight loss program, my program, because they lost weight and then they're gaining it all back again. Um, I think that because today, you know, certainly with my iDiet program, people who need to lose 100 pounds can lose 100 pounds. I, I think that, you know, you should use gastric bypass surgery only after you know, really trying to make the other things work because it's not the easy uh, it's not the easy solution that the surgeons like to make out. And, and, you know, I know people personally that have died from the operation. It is not without risk. Yeah, totally. It's, yeah, the operation's dangerous. It's hard. You lose all the pleasure of eating. Um, you, so many people gain the weight back. You know, the surgeons are all going how to do these surgeries, but they don't look at the complications afterwards. It's it's tragic. Yeah. Thank thank you for saying that. Maybe you'll have spared somebody from having that operation. So can you please tell us what you're going to be if people wanted to see you in person? You I would love to. You sound absolutely lovely and fascinating. When this PCRM conference is and what you'll be speaking about. Oh, um, I will be happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me at the conference. I'm, I'm looking forward to it very much, and I will certainly set aside some time. Um, if they go to, uh, actually, if they go to my website, the www.myidiet.com, um, they can go to the info and just send an email uh, with their name and contact saying that they'd like to to meet me, and I'll and I'll make sure to send a, an email out to everybody to to fix up a time. That's wonderful. Thank you. And do you, I don't have the, the 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 calendar in front of me, but do you remember at this con- conference is in November? The PCRM conference is that correct? Or uh, I think it's over the summer. Uh, oh, the it summer. Might be in okay. I'll make sure I get that information out to, to our listeners. Well, we're right. just about out of time. It just I loved, I so enjoyed talking to you. But my next question, maybe my last question is, is you've written all these uh, research papers. Is there a way for people to read them? Or maybe are you writing a book? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing a book right now. Um, I'm focusing on getting the program uh in a good shape on the web, and there may be another book in the in the works. But right now, I'm trying to get the I'm trying to get the web program totally free running so that we can help a lot of people that way. Thank you so much. Wow, I, I really appreciate the work you're doing, and you know, you're a testimonial that that it works because you've done it yourself, and it's just it's just been such a pleasure talking to you. I would still love to read your research papers. I'm a science nerd, so is it, where do we go? We just put your name in PubMed. Susan Roberts PhD and your papers will come up. Well, yeah, uh, you can it's you can definitely go to PubMed and, and look them up and you know, thank you very much for your interest. You know, we we're, we're we it's feel just, honored to be doing this research and uh, it's great to have it out there in the in the press so people can understand what we're doing. Yeah. Well thank you so much for your time, Doctor Roberts, for your passion and for your work. I so appreciate it. Thank you very much. Pleasure okay. to talk to you. So you've been listening to Healthy Living with Chef AJ and my guest, Dr. Susan Roberts. Thank you so much. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious.